Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with a return guest, Dr. Emil Torres. This is, in fact, our third interview and the second part of our talk about their great latest book, Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation. And today we're focusing mostly on the second part of the book that has to do with existential ethics. So, Dr. Torres, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Okay, so we've already touched a little bit on existential ethics, in fact, in our first two interviews. In the first one, because we talk about the ethics of long-termism, and in the second one, we talked a little bit about pro-mortalist views, so that's two different kinds of views there. But uh, just to introduce the topic, let's say, what would you say are perhaps the main questions that people who do work on existential ethics uh, care about? And by the way, how old would you say is existential ethics? Yeah, great questions. Um, I think the field traces its origins back to, um, I think most notably, like the second half of the 19th century. Yeah. Um, that was the first time there were there was a utilitarian named Henry Sidgwick who addressed, albeit in passing, uh, the ethical aspects of human extinction. And then there were there was a group of uh, philosophers in the German uh, pessimist tradition uh, who held kind of pro extinctionist views. So they thought you know humanity ultimately should should go extinct. And so I think they were the. I mean, really, you, you could go back a little bit before that to. Um, a 1721, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, ep epistolary novel by Montesquieu called The Persian Letters. Uh, and he, you know, also in passing, addresses uh, the possibility of humanity going extinct and yeah. describes it as the greatest calamity imaginable. So that's kind of interesting. And Mary Shelley is another person who I think articulated um, Claims that are directly pertinent to existential ethics. Uh, Mary so, Shelley, the novelist. Right? The novelist. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so this was in her um, 1826 book, *The Last Man*. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, of course, she's she's most famous for *Frankenstein*, uh, yeah. written, written a bit a bit earlier than that. Um, but yeah, so Mary Shelley also was an early contributor. And then fast forwarding a bit through the 1800s, you have the German pessimist and. Uh, Henry Sidgwick and and so on. And so really like the, the main, the, the core questions of existential ethics concern the ethical and evaluative implications of human extinction. Uh, but there's all sorts of other like more specific questions that you could, you know, ask. So with respect to those core questions, you know, it's, it's like, would human extinction, would, would actively bringing about human extinction uh, be right or wrong? Um, independent of how it actually comes about, would it be a good or bad state of affairs? Or would it be better or worse than the, yeah. the alternative, which is continuing to exist? Um, and those more specific questions would be like, you know, do we have an obligation to past people that, um, in, that suggests we need to ensure our continued survival into the future? Um, you know, do, should the interests of hypothetical future people uh, be a part of our moral deliberations with respect to human extinction. Um, you know, other questions would be like, if um, human extinction were imminent or yeah. imminent in a, a kind of a bit of a looser sense, like maybe just a hundred years from now, yeah. how might that undermine key sources of meaning and value in our lives today? So there's some philosophers who argue that, you know, if we were to, uh, for example, see an asteroid, heading towards earth and we realize there's just nothing we could do to stop it. Maybe it's just too big, uh, something like that. And uh, astronomers calculated that it will strike in a hundred years and humanity is gonna die out as a result of the impact winter that would result. Um, then yeah, how would that, you know, some of these philosophers would argue that that would seriously compromise key aspects of value and meaning in our lives. It would, it would, um, 
impede our ability to live what one philosopher calls value-laden lives. So lives that consist of a value. Because uh, a lot of the projects we work on are like ameliorative, so they're about improving the world, and they're uh, transgenerational in nature. So we're, you know, mm -hmm. just the, the individuals contributing to these projects that transcend us. And consequently, if we thought that human extinction was going to happen in 100 years, those projects that give us so much meaning in our life um, would be uh, vitiated or, or something of, of, of that sort. And so, yeah, that would ultimately result in us sort of tumbling into a state of despair and uh, despondency and so on. And then this is the claim, at least. There are other philosophers who think that actually that's wrong. <laughs> but so th these are some of the, the ideas that um, existential ethics deals with. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that when it comes to existential ethics, it's not just a matter of evaluating if it would be good or bad or neutral for humanity to go extinct, but also how we evaluate life and human life particularly itself, if, if it's good or bad, if it's uh, mostly about suffering or mostly about pleasure, and if it's actually worth living or not, right? Because you mentioned pessimists there, and I guess that one of them you were referring to implicitly was Schopenhauer, but then we also have antinatalists like David Benatar who argue more or less along the same line. So it's actually about also evaluating if life itself is worth living or not. And then that has implications as to how we or they think about human extinction, correct? Yes, definitely. That's absolutely right. Um, you know, the, 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 um, the philosophical worldview of pessimism. So it's yeah. it's you know this is a, a particular position you could take within philosophy. Um, you know you could find bits of it going back all the way to the ancient Greeks. Um, there was a play yeah. by Sophocles, as I recall, in which uh, part of the choir was something like you know um, uh, best you know uh, if you come into existence. You know, l life is is terrible, so it's it's best that you leave as soon as possible. the The absolute best option, though, is to never be born. So this this sort of you know, a, a, sorry, I can't recall the, the exact uh, words off the top of my head, but you know, this sort of sentiment, yeah, was you know it articulated even you know uh, several millennia ago, um, and then it's it really um, acquires a kind of systematic um uh d development uh in the latter 19th century with the german pessimists so schopenhauer is like the main <laughs> figure there but you know there are various other philosophers right around the same time who built on his work like edward von hartmann and a guy named philip mainlander mm -hmm. and so all of this is to say that yes if you judge human life to be of negative value, then you might be inclined to say actually going extinct would be the best thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but life is just flooded and saturated with suffering. You get rid of human life, you don't have that uh, pain, suffering, misery, and so on. And so that would just be a better situation. So th that's definitely one, uh, you know, basically you start with pessimism. And then you end up with this kind of pro-extinctionist uh, conclusion, basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're totally right. And I guess that one of the things I would like to get into here today is, uh, and you also talk about that in the book, the different kinds of possible human extinction. And last time in our previous conversation, we talked about the complication about what human and extinction actually means. So let's leave the human part aside because we've already discussed that and what it could mean in this case. But what are the different kinds of extinction that people consider here? Yeah, great. So I, I think this is pretty important for existential ethics. I feel like the, the, disambiguating the term human extinction is kind of foundational for existential ethics research. Um, and so, yeah, there are multiple different definitions of human with respect to extinction. There's 
I think there's at least six different types that are oftentimes just conflated in the literature and in discussions about human extinction, mm -hmm. which results in a certain degree of conversational confusion and you know merely verbal debates and, and things of that uh, nature. So, so just a quick example, like you might hear uh, long-termists, or I would, call, I would refer to them as test realists, um, you know, transhumanism all the way to, to long-termism, uh, talk about the importance of avoiding human extinction. If you look closely, the type of human extinction that they're uh, referring to is not the type of human extinction that most people, um, that would come to mind for, for most people if you were to ask mm -hmm. them about it. Uh, so, you know, for them, like they, the notion of human is, uh, it has a broader extension, it includes certain mm -hmm. uh, future beings that might be post-human, you yes. know, <laughs> individuals who would not belong to the species Homo sapiens. Um, and ultimately, they advocate for a transition away from Homo sapiens to mm -hmm. post-humanity. So they, there's the, the I, I think the more intuitive understanding of human extinction is something that they advocate for. What they don't want is for us to uh, disappear without having successors. Mm -hmm. uh, these post-human successors, maybe they're intelligent machines, maybe they're beings that we evolve into by merging with technology or uploading our minds. So all this to say that th they are for a kind of human extinction, the elimination or at least marginalization of homo sapiens being replaced with post-humans. They're just, so So all of their talk of like the importance of avoiding human extinction is just, you know, it, it, it's, it's really misleading, I think. So that being said, the six types of, of human extinction are to, to list them quickly at first, and then I'll go back and explain them. Uh, demographic, phyletic, terminal, mm -hmm. final, normative, and premature. Okay. Those are the six types of, of extinction. And so demographic, so, I, and, and I, I, I think that these different, that this typology is important, not just for ex, existential ethics, for understanding the ethical and evaluative implications of human extinction, but also understanding the history of thinking about human extinction. Um, so demographic extinction is defined as simply what happens when the human population falls from wherever it is now or in the future to zero. And mm -hmm. so that can happen. Uh, that's that's the entire definition, period. Um, and so this could happen, you know, very quickly. Um, theoretically could happen at close to the speed of light. If, for example, the Large Hadron Collider under the Franco-Swiss importer <laughs> were to accidentally yeah. uh, nucleate what's called a vacuum bubble, mm -hmm. which then, <laughs> you know, it's basically the universe might be in this false vacuum state and then you accidentally tip it into a true vacuum state. So it's sort of like a reboot kind of on the universe. And there's a bubble of basically destruction that expands at the speed of light. So if that happens, you know, tomorrow or maybe just in like two minutes, we would never see it coming. We couldn't see it coming, you know? <laughs> and so demographic extinction would happen, you know, uh, um, instantaneously, but it also could be very drawn out. You know, maybe there's an infertility scenario that results in the population dwindling to zero over you know, two, three centuries, something like that. So then phyletic extinction is um, in contrast to demographic extinction where our evolutionary lineage terminates. Uh -huh. Phyletic extinction happens when our evolutionary lineage continues, but future beings end up evolving to become so different from us today that we would count them as a completely different species. So some kind okay. of post-human uh, beings. Um, and so, you know, th this is basically what happened with, you know, you could draw a, uh, an evolutionary lineage from Homo sapiens all the way back to the Australopithecines, mm -hmm. um, you know, more than two and a half million years ago. Um, and it's just an unbroken chain. So we are a different species from them, but, you um, we're still genealogically linked to them. So that, that can happen in our future as well. And you know, it, it, given enough time, simply because of Darwinian evolutionary mechanisms, so natural selection, uh, recombination, genetic drift, mm -hmm. mutation, so on, um, becoming a post-human species is inevitable. That's just gonna take 
hundreds of thousands or millions of years, <laughs> you know. And but, that, that was actually what I was going to say. I mean, at yeah. least according to evolutionary theory, and we know that it's correct, it's basically inevitable that we will have that kind of extinction if you consider it that. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're not some kind of like final, you know, every species in evolution is a transitional species unless it's the last species and the, the lineage just ends <laughs> you know yeah. otherwise it's a transitional species and so mm -hmm. either our lineage is going to end in the future or we're going to evolve into something else it's completely inevitable but it seems much more likely uh for better or for worse uh we'll probably use technology to modify ourselves i mean this this just seems like the direction that uh our you know technological society is heading mm -hmm. so in a you know or, or as an alternative to all these darwinian mechanisms there's also this mechanism mechanism of cyborgization um you know merging with you know using genetic engineering to change certain phenotypic aspects uh features of the human organism uh nanotechnology ai maybe even mind uploading and so on so mm -hmm. In this sense, there's spatiotemporal continuity across time, but we end up being just very, very different. So that's phyletic extinction. Um, and then there is terminal extinction. And so this adds a, an extra condition uh, to the definition. It says that human extinction would happen if there are uh, no more instances of Homo sapiens, and that remains the case forever. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, demographic extinction, it just doesn't say anything about that. Same with phyletic extinction. Um, so shifting for just a moment to, to, uh, to focus on non-human animals, this distinction between terminal and phyletic or demographic extinction is really important with respect to this uh, emerging field called resurrection biology. So there are a bunch of synthetic mm -hmm. biologists who want to de-extinct organisms like the uh, carrier pigeon, the woolly mammoth, maybe even ne Neanderthals. Yeah. Um, and so in this case, these species, if they were resurrected, they were brought back to uh, into existence, then they would have undergone demographic extinction, but not terminal extinction. So that's it. And so looking at the human case, like, I don't know, there, there are mostly science fiction scenarios in which, uh, the, you know, we might undergo demographic, but not terminal extinction. Um, but also there are historical reasons, I think, for making this distinction. So if you look at some of the ancient Greek philosophers, um, uh, a, a handful of them proposed cosmological models or theories of the, the universe that were cyclical in nature. And in these cyclical models, there was a phase during which no humans at all existed. So Empedocles, um, Xenophanes are a few examples. The Stoics also kind of had this um, uh, a, a similarly cyclical view, you know, where at some point in the future, the entire universe would be, would be purged, mm -hmm. uh, purified by this great conflagration. And then after that, we don't disappear forever. We, we do disappear entirely for a, at least a moment. And then we reappear. Mm -hmm. And and um, the tape of history replays exactly as it did before. So this is the notion of the eternal return. The, the Stoics were the, the ones who um, were into this idea. Uh, the Adonis are another example. So anyways, point is, according to these models, we undergo demographic extinction, but never terminal extinction. And so mm -hmm. in fact, we've undergone, I mean, the implication is we've undergone demographic extinction infinite number of times in the past, and we'll undergo an infinite number of times in the future, but we will never undergo terminal extinction. So there's very, uh, nonetheless, a kind of robust sense in which we're indestructible. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a permanent fixture of the universe, even if there's a phase during which there are no more humans. And so, so that's the distinction. That, that This gestures at the importance of, of uh, I, um, identifying terminal extinction as a unique type of extinction. Okay, so that brings us to final extinction. Um, and so this would occur if uh, terminal extinction were to happen and we were to have no successors after us. So this is really important for existential ethics because there are a lot of theorists who would say that if Homo sapiens disappears entirely and forever, that would not be bad if we have post-human 
successors of some sort. So th this is a type of you know I I extinction. It could be the you know for for example there are some uh, you know transhumanists or or proto transhumanists who mm -hmm. mm, such as Hans Borbeck, computer scientist, who imagined that in the future we will be replaced by intelligent machines. He saw this as desirable, and in fact, he wanted to actively help bring it about. Hmm. So, so basically what he was advocating for is like terminal extinction, no more homo sapiens, but without final extinction. And so he would say that if, you know, final extinction, that would be really, really bad. Just a complete end to the entire human story. There's nothing that comes after us. There's no, you know, uh, progeny that we create that then carry on the torch of human civilization and scientific discovery and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, ter terminal ex final extinction would be very bad, but terminal extinction, there's nothing inherently bad about that at all, so long as it does not coincide with final extinction. So that's that's the, the, the key idea with final extinction is just do we have successors? Um, and so th this brings me to, to normative extinction, mm -hmm. which would occur if we do have successors, yeah. but they were to evolve in a certain way such that they came to lack properties necessary for them to count as human in a broader sense of the term. Right. So for example, a lot of futurists define uh, humanity as our current species, homo sapiens, or any future beings mm -hmm. that are genealogically or causally related to us and have a certain kind of moral status comparable to ours. So maybe they're like conscious, you know, there, there, there might be all sorts of properties that are required for them to have moral status like consciousness, um, but ultimately they are beings that, that matter in a moral sense. You know, like a rock doesn't matter in a moral sense. You know, you kick it down right. the street, you just don't think twice. And that's, mm -hmm. that's you know, nobody should be concerned about the well-being of rocks because <laughs> there's no reason to think that they feel anything. So as long as, you know, but, you know, then there are, you know, other animals out there and humans and so on. And these are um, what philosophers would call moral patients. You know, they're, they're beings that matter morally. And so this definition of, of humanity, including our descendants on the condition that they have a certain kind of moral status. If you say that's what human means, mm -hmm. then if these future beings exist, but lack those extra properties needed to count as human, then there are no more humans. And if there are no more humans, then human extinction has happened. So that's why it's it's called normative uh, extinction, because on these sort of normative definitions of what it means to be human, even though we have successors, they're, they're not human successors. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, consequently, you know, extinction will have happened. So, so okay, that brings us to the, the last <laughs> uh, the last category here, which is premature extinction. This just introduced the idea that the timing matters. When extinction mm -hmm. happens, in maybe any of the previous types, when it happens matters morally. So you might hold, for example, this kind of uh, teleological view of the of the human story of human development uh, and so on, according to which we are building up to some kind of uh, accomplishment. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it's like a complete theory of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that, and someone might say, oh, that, that really matters. Like morally, it matters that we develop the, a complete theory of everything uh, and come to understand, you know, why there's something rather than nothing. Um, and so they might say, you know, human extinction, let's say final human extinction happens after we attain that prized, uh, valued endpoint that would be very bad. But if it, if final human extinction happens before, that would be much worse. And so yeah. they would say if it happens before, that's premature extinction. And yeah. that you know, has a certain kind of moral uh, dimension to it um, in contrast to like extinction happening after, which still might be bad, but it's extra bad if it happens before reaching this telos. And there are a whole bunch of other telos that mm -hmm. some might have. Maybe it's just like maximizing the total amount of value in the universe. You know, maybe we've like, you know, maximum, we've re-engineered galaxies and so on. We sort of, 
you know, uh, created just about all the value that the, the universe could possibly contain, and then we go extinct. Well, that's going to be much, maybe that's still bad, but it's going to be much, much, much better than if we go extinct before we've even started to colonize space. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, of course, there are all of these different kinds of you, you, uh, ways of going extinct, but I guess that uh, lots of it tied to uh, tied to the idea that if we as humans, with our psychological mental mental properties, just disappear from the universe, then and this is also something that I guess uh, is argued by further loss theorists that. Uh, not only humanity itself, but I guess also the universe in general would be losing something because there wouldn't, uh, there would not be a species or a, a group of beings there that would be conscious, intelligent, being able to produce and appreciate art, science, and uh, other intellectual stuff, right? I mean, it ties a lot to those kinds of ideas when it comes to why it might be bad for humanity to go and be extinct, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And so, um, you know, I don't remember exactly what we went over in the previous um, uh, yeah, discussion. actually, in our previous podcast, at a certain point, I asked you about the distinction between going extinct and uh, yes. being extinct. And that yeah. was also something that I was pointing to here uh, implicitly, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess just to like very briefly recap that, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really, really important uh, distinction. Absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there are a bunch of theories that say being extinct is totally morally irrelevant. One reason you might think that is if there's nobody around to be harmed by the non-existence of humanity, the non-existence of science and technology and art and so on, then where is um, the wrong? <laughs> where is the bad? What's bad about that if nobody is actually harmed? So mm -hmm. nobody can be harmed by being extinct. Therefore, being extinct is just not morally relevant. And yeah. everything comes down to, to being extinct. And then you've got these further loss theorists who say, no, 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 there's, there's all sorts of uh, further losses associated with being extinct. Mm -hmm. um, you might, you know, some of these might be classified as opportunity costs. Uh, right. And those are morally relevant. So yeah, it's, it's you know, they would say like, you know, what a, a shame, like a moral shame. <laughs> so shame in kind of a deep sense, uh, if the universe if let's say we're the only um, intelligent beings, I mean, I use the word intelligent in scare quotes because you know we're we're kind of a ridiculous species. <laughs> but let's say we're the only intelligent beings in the you know in the accessible universe. Yeah. Um, and if we disappear, then you're totally right. Then you know there, there's no more. There aren't any creatures to like marvel at the, the midnight firmament and um, just just be you know enraptured by wonder and awe at everything or to create art and you know and all of that is just sort of a a loss to the universe in a kind of more impersonal sense it's yeah. it's not that particular people would suffer the absence of art and knowledge and wonder and so on because there would mm -hmm. be no people around if we went extinct Rather, it's just in this kind of more, more impersonal sense, yeah. you know, the universe would just be in, impoverished. Um, and so, yeah, these, these further losses, the, these opportunity costs, um, uh, those are morally relevant and hence give us reason to ensure that we don't go extinct because independent of how going extinct happens, if it's catastrophic mm -hmm. or, you know, even if it's voluntary, <laughs> being extinct would still be very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Which is very interesting because it also, in a sense, ties back to that idea that I mentioned earlier about 
what human means because you mentioned the theorist there i can't recall his name i'm sorry but uh, that who suggests that it would be good for us to develop for example super intelligent machines even if they end up replacing us because i guess that the idea there i might be wrong but the idea there is that those super intelligent machines would have the same uh, important or uh, mental properties that we have or the ones we value and perhaps would even improve upon them and so in a way it would be more or less like humans continuing to exist in in a way i guess yes absolutely um so i don't think that everybody is too concerned about whether or not um, our, um, you know, our machinic uh, progeny, our, our mind children, as Hans Moravec uh, calls them, yeah. um, are conscious. There are some people out there who say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they share our values. Machines taking over is just the next natural step in cosmic evolution. So Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, holds this view. It's very weird, you know, but most people who have written about existential ethics do very much hold the position that you just delineated uh, very nicely, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is like, yeah, actually maybe our post-human successors would be better positioned and better capable than us uh, mm -hmm. to wonder, uh, <laughs> to marvel at the universe, to create yeah. art and, and to not just create, but appreciate art um, and so on. So yeah, it, it, there, there's, you know, there, there are some individuals out there kind of in this particular tradition who are explicit that this is why they think we should replace mm -hmm. ourselves. Uh, so there was a paper published by a guy named Derek Schiller, um, and it was published just a few years ago. And it's titled something like In Defense of, uh, you know, Artificial Replacement or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he makes the case that, yeah, I mean, maybe there are beings... Um, you know, like in this the space of possible beings, you mm -hmm. know, maybe that's vast. And humanity occupies just this tiny little corner. So maybe there are other regions of the space mm -hmm. of possible beings um, that, or, or where there exist possible creatures, maybe creatures that we could create, who have just a much greater capacity, even for things like happiness. You know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we have to medicate ourselves with antidepressants and so on, but maybe we just create a new kind of being that is, you know, it's just natural default setting is extreme happiness. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are all sorts of like very significant problems with this idea, but I mean, from a very abstract, you know, uh, very theoretical disconnected from kind of reality and practical the com complexities of practical um issues and questions it makes sense like yeah why not want to just create a bunch of beings maybe they're you know completely artificial they're just machines but yeah they're, they're just super happy all the time maybe they're super intelligent and yeah. um you know they look at a work of art and they just like feel ecstasy and and weep with joy whereas we look at it and go like yeah that's that's nice so <laughs> yeah okay so let's put a pin on uh, becoming post-human because i want to talk more about transhumanism in a second but just before that there's a also recently something that has become at least to some extent more or less popular i guess that we haven't talked much about yet for example in our previous podcast we talked about some pro-mortalist views out there like omnicide and voluntary collective suicide, I would I guess. But there's also anti-natalism. And of course, nowadays, that's an idea that's mostly associated with people like David Benatar. So what are your thoughts actually on anti-natalism? Because I know that uh, some of the ideas that the David Benatar has about it, particularly the asymmetry argument, many people have criticized it as being incoherent. And mm -hmm. then it's also not completely clear if antinatalism would also lead to a 
pro mortalist stance in the sense that if life is so bad, then it would be better for us to commit suicide. I don't think so, because Benatar, I guess, in his book, Better Never to Have Been, argues that once we're alive, death is uh, is bad mm -hmm. for, for us. I mean, it's it, it, it's a bit weird because it's it's like saying that life is so bad, full of suffering, but at the same time, once we're alive, death is also bad. So, I mean, what are your views on it? <laughs> yeah, he... Um... He has an interesting view on these issues. So he, on the one hand, he argues that it's important to distinguish between a life worth starting and a life worth continuing. Right. And yeah, and so you know, one of his one of his arguments for antinatalism is that harm benefit asymmetry that that you mentioned, um, and another is just a kind of, uh, as far as I could tell, it's just an updated version of Schopenhauer. You know, so it's just like life is just. Is just flooded with awfulness and misery and tears and torments and agony and anguish and, and so on. Um, and but then he wants to say, well, yes, things are really bad. In fact, a lot worse than most of us are willing or even capable of admitting to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But they're not so bad that it would be rational for us all just to, to jump off a bridge. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, he, he, he says it's like going to a, a movie and, uh, you know, halfway through realizing like this is just a, a really bad movie, but it's not so bad that you, you go home, <laughs> you know. And then on top of it, he has this, uh, what would be called an anti-Epicurean view of death. Um, so Epicurus famously argued that death does not harm the person who dies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it may harm you know, John dying might cause harm to the people around him who loved him and are going to miss him and so on. But it doesn't harm John himself um, because, you know, once when you're alive, uh, you're consequently not dead. So death isn't harming you. When you're dead, you don't exist anymore. And so you can't be harmed. <laughs> So where you know, point to the the moment that death itself actually harms the the, the person. Uh, there is no moment. That's what he he you know claims at least. And so Benatar, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of other philosophers share this view that that's just not the case. That death can be a harm to the person who dies. So e even if you know, e even if mm -hmm. um, you know, there were some kind of um, uh, you know. For for some reason we don't understand. Um, I just vanished. Or let's just say you know somebody somebody just dies randomly and instantaneously. There's no you know they don't suffer. Mm -hmm. There's no psychological distress because they don't see it coming and so on. It just happens. Um, they would argue that death has still harmed them, even though they didn't suffer psychologically or physically uh, as a result of dying. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you know, maybe because it's you know there are there's happiness, there are, there are good experiences that could that the individual could have had that they are deprived of. So this is the deprivationist view. It's a version of anti-epicureanism. Yeah. And so yeah, Benatar also wants to say that. So not only is the is the movie we're watching, which is life existence, um, not it's really bad, but it's not so bad that we should all want to jump jump off a bridge. But also, death itself is a harm. And so that's an extra reason why, you know, maybe we wouldn't want to commit suicide. Um, so, yeah, and and um, I agree that the, um, in addition to his Schopenhauerian, you know, just look, uh, it's an empirical argument, basically, just look around the world. It's it's awful. Um, in addition to that argument for antinatalism, for why you shouldn't have kids, uh, he also proposes this harm benefit uh, asymmetry. But I agree that it's it's pretty incoherent. Um, I didn't always think that. I, I used to, to find it pretty compelling. Um, but it does seem, you know, it, it, it is, you know, basically like, you know, if you're alive, then you experience uh, pleasure and pain. Pleasure is mm -hmm. good. Pain is bad. So being alive is a good, bad situation. If you don't exist, then you, of course, don't experience pleasure or pain. Well, the absence of pleasure 
is not bad because nobody's around to suffer that absence. It's very different than if you exist and you are deprived of pleasure you know, or happiness. Um, but if you don't exist, it's just not bad. And then he claims that the absence of pain, if you don't exist, that that is just good. And so non-existence is a good, not bad situation. And a good, not bad situation is better than a good, bad situation. And uh, so, but the, the, the incoherency, of course, as I'm sure, you, I, I suspect I'm telling you stuff you already know. So my apologies for that. Um, uh, uh, but, no, no, but, but also for the audience, at sure. least this is important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so the, the incoherence is saying that um, if you don't exist, the absence of pleasure is not bad. Why? Mm. Because there's nobody around to be deprived of that pleasure or happiness. Yeah. And yet the absence of pain is positively good. Um, well, who is it good for? It's not good. <laughs> you know, I mean, Benatar, yeah. I think he wants to literally say that it's good for the individual who doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And then he ends up in this just, that's just an awkward view to hold because you're saying that, okay, the absence of pleasure is not bad because the person doesn't exist, but the absence of pain is good for that person who doesn't exist. I mean, even calling the, the non-existence person a person is misleading. It's a non-person. It's just, it's nothing, <laughs> you know? And uh, so, yeah, th that does seem to be a problem with the harm benefit uh, asymmetry. Just, it doesn't seem consistent. That being said, I, I think his, uh, you know, the Schopenhauerian claim, that, that argument, um, that's, I think, fairly strong. Like the world is really, you know, pretty, I mean, in my estimation, at least, I, I have an article forthcoming on this, actually. <laughs> but I mean, the, the world is like, it didn't have to be this way. Um, you, you know, uh, as I mentioned the article, I mean, when I was a, a young child, I remember like a very young child, just sort of like looking around in wonder at all at this, this strange place. I didn't know how I ended up here. I didn't know really where I was. I didn't know what this place was like. And, you know, for all I knew, the world could have turned out to be just an absolutely lovely place where, you know, there aren't any genocides and nobody, you know, there's no such thing as cancer and so on. Um, and it, it just turns out the world isn't like that at all. And so that, you know, that's a kind of Schopenhauerian argument for, uh, for the anti-natalist position, and also either through anti-natalism or completely independent of anti-natalism, that could be an argument for pro-extinctionism. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, right. if life is actually, gosh, I mean, the, the, the human realm is just kind of terrible. And so if you get rid of the human realm, you get rid of the terribleness. <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's a reason to, to do that and get rid of the, the human realm somehow. Yeah, and uh, no, look, I definitely don't want to. Uh, I, I'm not uh, against optimist views, world views that people might have. It's good that people can uh, cope with life and feel happy and all of that. But I definitely agree or think that uh, the number of ways out there that you can suffer is limitless <laughs> at least for humans so i i guess that's something that most people uh, can agree with well, one of the things that benatar points at so i i'm generally not a fan of of benatar the the uh, the yeah. philosopher himself um, there's lots to say about that but um one of the points he makes which uh, i think he's the first one to uh, to put it this way and it's it's sort of yeah, it's a, a nice way of putting the point um, is that there is chronic pain. There's no such thing as chronic pleasure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you're right. Like just the types of suffering is, you know, it's just kind of endless. Um, mm -hmm. The types of happiness, I don't know, maybe I haven't really thought about that point uh, carefully so much, but the, certainly the degree to the possible intensity of suffering mm -hmm. uh, can vastly uh, exceed the possible intensity of pleasure. So like most people, if they're asked, like, would you uh, trade, you know, 24 hours of the most horrendous torture for, you know, the rest of your life or maybe the next hundred years of just like blissful existence. Most people, uh, I think if they spend a minute thinking about what the worst kinds of torture would 
involve, entail, and feel like, they'd probably yeah. go, you know, even, I don't know, even two hours. Um, you know, when when you suffer, time slows down. When you mm -hmm. are having a good time, yeah. you, you know, gosh, where, where did the time go? So this is all these built-in, you know, features of the, the human uh, experience in the world yeah. also sort of conspire to... Uh, to lead to a kind of Schopenhauerian <laughs> assessment of things. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, uh, uh, let's leave it at that and let people decide on their own if they have a more optimist or pessimist view of life. So, but but let's get in a little bit into transhumanism now. I, I, I find it really interesting because, I mean, there are different ways of being a transhumanist, I guess, different uh, things that people suggest we could do to go beyond, I guess, being human. I mean, there's, for example, becoming cyborgs, genetic engineering, uh, yeah. different sorts of medical developments, I guess. Uh, also, I guess that some people even suggest becoming digital beings in some way. It's very hard for me to understand what that would entail. But anyway, there's different ideas out there. But but I guess that okay. So th there are two things, two things here. So first of all, there's sort of a positive way of looking at it as being just an idea of improving people's life in a way going beyond their biological limitations in terms of what causes us suffering and in terms of going beyond death also sometimes people talk about that but on the other hand that there's also a negative way of looking at it there is many people it seems to me i might be wrong but many people who seem to be associated with the transhumanist movement tend to have these sort of hierarchical ideas about what Kant says good traits bad traits in humans mm -hmm. and then they have sort of this view that uh, if some people would become transhuman they would be inherently better than common humans and and also i see that in some people rakers while for example and some other people that talk a lot about becoming people becoming immortal and overcoming death there, there seems to be a, a lot of obsession with they themselves i guess yeah. becoming immortal and a lot of fear of that fear. I, I mean, what would be your comments on all of that, I guess? Yeah, definitely. Oh, I think a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of transhumanists do suffer from uh, uh, intense death anxiety. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yes, part of the, the transhumanist project is you know it goes beyond particular individuals uh and because the aim is is ultimately to you know create basically a utopian future in which the beings that exist there uh these post-human entities yeah. uh they are you know awash in uh to quote nick bostrom's letter from utopia surpassing bliss and delight but also there is this kind of, you know, more personal self-interested aspect to it. A lot of transhumanists uh, that want themselves to make it to that utopia, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, trans you know, Ray Kurzweil, for example, talks about uh, living long enough to live forever. So maybe it's the case that, you know, if, if you, if we can only manage to survive for another 20 years, then at that point, there will be life extension technologies that will um, enable us to live just maybe another five years. Mm -hmm. But because the pace of technological development is exponential, during those five years, they'll develop a new life extension technology that will give us another like eight years. And then within that eight years, that extra eight years that we have, there'll be this new technology that'll give us 50 years. Mm -hmm. And then once we're 50 years in, they'll have, okay, Here's a, this new rejuvenation technology that enables you to live indefinitely long. 
So mm -hmm. if you if you you know attain what they call uh, longevity escape velocity, um, then yeah, then you you will have lived forever, lived long enough to live forever. But also they have their own version of resurrection as well, right? If you don't live that long, then maybe you could just uh, sign up for uh, a California, uh, no Arizona, I think now uh, based company called Alcor, and they'll just cryogenize your body or just your head and neck uh, after you die. And then when the future tech, when future technologies um, are developed that would enable you to be resurrected and reanimated, uh, then they'll bring you back to, to life. <laughs> um, so yeah, d definitely death anxiety is a big part of it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. And you're, you're totally right that um, th there is a question, I think a very serious philosophical question about how this normative term of, of better is defined. And relatedly, it, intimately connected to that, is, is um, how one identifies biological limitations in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as far as I could tell, the value system that transhumanists use to define better and to identify which limitations, which biological features are limitations and therefore need to be transcended, uh, all of that's just basically an extension of capitalism. <laughs> you know, it's all, all sorts of values that um, are important within the capitalist system. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, I, you might even say a sort of techno-capitalist system. Uh, those values like efficiency and a certain kind of reliability Mm -hmm. speed, information processing uh, capabilities, and so on. All of those are good to have in machines uh, and within the, the capitalist milieu. Uh, and then those values are taken and some would argue inappropriately applied to the human domain. And mm -hmm. you know, so it, what they ultimately want is like, you know, to upload their minds so they can think a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, some of them fantasize about you know expanding their uh, memories memories so that they can retain you know the entire library of Congress. Uh, uh, also, actually, sometimes implanting chips in your brain to increase your I don't know cognitive efficiency in some way. Yeah, right. yeah, totally. And, and, and I think part of uh, a difficulty in making this critique is that a lot of us are so embedded within the capitalist system mm -hmm. that to even suggest that things like efficiency um, might not be, that, that might not be a value that is justified or, or we should question that value. I think for many of us, that just seems like completely weird, but it's worth taking a step back and saying that yeah. response that it's weird is itself weird. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, for most of human history, um, these these values were not emphasized, were not identified mm -hmm. as things that we should, you know, strive to True. attain, to embody, and so on. I mean, what is it about living a meaningful life that requires us to process information faster or be more efficient or be more productive, you know, and, and so on? Maybe maybe these values are not only irrelevant. Maybe they're antithetical, antithetical mm -hmm. to living actually a really meaningful life. Um, and, and, so and actually, I guess that, and this is just an example. If we were to ask, for example, some ancient philosophers, even virtue ethicists like Aristotle, I wouldn't imagine them saying that efficiency is one of the things that makes human life better I guess. yeah if you want to attain eudaimonia true contentment yeah. and satisfaction and happiness be more efficient be more productive be you know <laughs> yeah you know more reliable in a, in a kind of robotic sense yeah so absolutely you're totally right um and so I think this is a big problem with, with transhumanism is a, a lot of them, I feel, don't even 
seriously question the underlying assumptions that go into identifying aspects of us as limitations you know and yeah. they, they just yeah don't really question those those values that are informing their notion of what it means to become a better mm. post-human species yeah and actually this is something also that we touched on in our first interview when we talked for example at a certain point about long-termism and some of its links, at least with some people with eugenics, and we talked about, and in this particular case of transhumanism, there are lots of people who are just obsessed with, uh, I mentioned earlier, genetic engineering, and they are obsessed with identifying genes associated with IQ, yeah. to improve IQ, to uh, for their children to score even higher in terms of their IQ, to improve certain other psychological traits. I know one of them that they also tend to consider good. And as you say, in particularly capitalist societies, con uh, a personality trait like conscientiousness, stuff like that. And even sometimes uh, you hear people talking about aesthetic traits like i don't know being more beautiful that is attractive to the opposite sex and then it ties to evolutionary ideas i guess in the sense so i guess that perhaps one of the ways this might be problematic is it uh, actually ranks people in terms of how good or bad they are as humans, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Human, uh, this notion of human hierarchy, yeah, um, that 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 is central uh, to this view. I mean, I, I think the notion of IQ is just a really impoverished um, way of understanding intelligence. Um, I mean, intelligence is just such a multi-dimensional. Um, property. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not one property. Maybe it's you know a whole bunch of different different properties. And but any but yeah, I mean but, you know like you know there there are artistic geniuses out there who who might not score very high on IQ tests. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who score extremely high and never contribute anything notable mm -hmm. to collective human knowledge or understanding. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm not putting them down at all for that. Yeah, that's, no, that's sure, fine. sure. But just saying, like it's it's just yeah, it's it's this linear scale, and you know you could sort of rank everybody on it. And yeah, I, I mean, I guess you could say a similar thing about a lot of these other metrics, you know, mm -hmm. which are just really basic, impoverished, um, uh, unsophisticated reliability, you know, efficiency, and so on. And you mm -hmm. just kind of kind of rank. Uh, people on these scales and then you can say okay the, the goal is to be more like the people at the top uh in fact it's to transcend them and yeah. be even more efficient or reliable or uh faster or whatever um so yeah you know and, and, I mean, and also uh, by the way let me just add because i had a recent interview with dr adam rutherford and he has a great book on eugenics i i, I think that the title is control and Actually, he's an evolutionary biologist. At a certain point, we even mentioned in the interview how even from a purely biological perspective, it doesn't make much sense to try to just uh, restrict humanity to people with particular traits that in a specific context we consider the better traits because it's also better to have a wider genetic pool in case the environments we have to adapt to, to change over time and that's just a purely biological perspective right i think that's that sounds great yeah i'd agree <laughs> <laughs> okay so by the way since we we're reaching our, also our time limit here i, I have just uh, two more questions if that's okay so uh, what are your own views on existential ethics, by the way, because we've talked about different 
theories that people have different views, different approaches to human extinction. Uh, I'm curious, what are your own views? What do you yourself think about human extinction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that um, it's possible for us to go extinct in a way that nobody suffers psychologically or physically, and it's completely voluntary. Um, so, you know, maybe everybody around the world decides uh, not to have children, in which yeah. case, you know, we, you know, 120 years at least or so um, will, will disappear. That is almost certainly never going to happen, <laughs> right? So by yeah. far the, the most likely ways that we'll go extinct um, will be in some kind of catastrophe. And here, I think it's it's really important to uh, to emphasize that the the awfulness, the horrors of uh, going extinct catastrophically uh, absolutely go far beyond, I think, what we're sort of constitutionally capable of understanding. And mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, so this ties into notions of like scope neglect and psychic numbing. These are like cognitive, cognitive, emotional biases or, or distortions that, um, like psychic numbing, for example, uh, says that, you know, as the number of casualties in a single event, um, increases beyond one, uh, are, so if, if, you know, casualties is on the, the X axis and the y-axis is our ability to um, basically feel, let's just say, basically feel bad <laughs> about the situation. <laughs> that tapers mm -hmm. off really quickly. So like, you know, you hear about four people who, you know, die in a car accident. That's like pretty awful. But, you know, if, if there's a, you know, a nuclear bomb that goes off and a newspaper reports that, um, it initially reports that there have been 8,957,392 uh, people who have died. And then they print a retraction, say, sorry, we accidentally um, forgot four people. And so the number actually is four greater than what we printed. Nobody goes, oh, that's terrible. Oh my gosh. That's, you know, it's just like, that's just, you know, four, given how many people have died, four is nothing. Like that's just sort of our natural reaction. And so I, I, all of this is to say, I think in sort of assessing the true badness of going extinct in a catastrophe, it's important to be mindful of these sorts of cognitive biases because they can distort uh, our, our assessment, our evaluation of just how bad it might be. Eight billion people dying yeah. is just, uh, you know, there's no words to describe how horrible that would be. And so on my view, uh, once you, you sort of, take into account the fact that we're not good at, at uh, grasping the true enormity of human extinction. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that we have every reason to, to work hard to avoid uh, um, catastrophic human extinction, you know, uh, an extinction causing catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my view then beyond that. So that, that concerns going extinct. Okay. Uh, that's that sort of feature, that aspect of human extinction. Then with respect mm -hmm. to being extinct, I don't know. I just have, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to work through these issues. On the one hand, I find a lot of the further loss uh, theories to be uncompelling. So this would include long-termism and totalist utilitarianism, uh, which again, you know, say that the, the, the non-existence of, you know, potentially very large number of future people, that that itself would be really bad. You know, no future people mm -hmm. to appreciate art, to experience happiness and so on. The universe right. itself in this impersonal sense is impoverished. Mm -hmm. um, I find the, the equivalence view to be correct on this issue, that if there's nobody around to suffer those losses, then um, nobody is harmed. If nobody's harmed, then what exactly is bad about that state of affairs? Um, so I'm very sympathetic with the equivalence view, um, not sympathetic with certain, at least certain kinds of further loss views like utilitarianism, long-termism. And then beyond that, the, 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 um, 
pe the pessimistic position in philosophy that motivates some pro-extinctionists that I also, I, I feel the, the pull of, you know, because like I was saying before, it does seem like the, the world is, it's pretty awful. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, my, my best guess right now is that a lot of people do work hard to, whether consciously or unconsciously, <laughs> to sort of shield themselves from some of these facts. But I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I don't want to put this too unfairly or tendentiously, but I feel, I feel like an honest look at the world leads to like a pretty bleak picture about things. And so I don't know if, you know, I, I, I think human extinction would be unimaginably awful uh, because it almost certainly would involve a catastrophe. And again, we should do mm -hmm. everything we can to prevent that from happening. Um, right. I'm, I'm passionate about that view, but if it did happen, if the worst happened and, and 8 billion people perished, there's, uh, there, there's, you know, a bit of a silver lining at the very end of that because, you know, all of the badness that just, you know, pervades uh, the theater of human existence mm -hmm. uh, would no longer be. And surely that would be in a, a certain sense, good, um, or at least better then, you know, and also, I mean, the other, the other thing that just sort of underlines this position for me, at least, is thinking seriously, and maybe I'm completely wrong about all this, but, but maybe I'm not, is sort of thinking seriously about how bad the future could be. You know, there, there are a lot of people right now who say, well, you know, there's, there's, we've made all sorts of progress, and, you know, Steven Pinker's out there saying, you know, the statistically violence has declined significantly over the, the centuries. And I think a lot of that is like deeply flawed. Um, a lot of the reasoning is is completely mis misleading. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, beyond that, um, if you think about what technology could enable us to do, um, then, you know, I, I mean, maybe it's possible that we do successfully create life extension technologies. If that's the case, then like, let's just, you know, let, let's just uh, take a moment to brainstorm how that could be misused. You know, maybe there's a totalitarian state that maintains control and political prisoners are kept in a dungeon and there are rejuvenation, reju rejuvenation therapies that are used to keep them alive. And then they're tortured. And, you know, and, and maybe they're tortured to the point where some of them die, but mm -hmm. immediately after they're resurrected with these advanced technologies. And so they could be in these dungeons for millions of years, <laughs> you know, like most people wouldn't trade 24 hours for a lifetime, uh, mm -hmm. 24 hours of torture for a lifetime happiness. Imagine being tortured for like, you know, a million years. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a bit science fiction-y, but like maybe, I don't think it's completely implausible that will invent these life extension technologies. Mm -hmm. And then, gosh, the amount of suffering and, and horror in the future could be terrible. So if extinction did happen, you know, let's say the Large Hadron Collider um, did nucleate this vacuum bubble uh, next week and we all just disappeared <laughs> in, a, in a flash. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there would be a silver lining to it at least. I mean, that's kind of my view. I know it's a, it's a dark, sad view, but it's like, I feel like that this, you know, just being alive for 41 years has just pushed me against my will to like go like, yeah, I don't know. The world is is, is pretty awful, pretty awful place. So that's sort of my view. It's, it's sort of a mixture of of these different positions and it's still evolving to some extent. Okay, so before I ask my last question, let me just add and also to help promote this sort of pessimist agenda <laughs> that um, actually you mentioned Stephen Pinker there and I had two very interesting interviews on the show with uh, critics of his work, one of them an Australian historian, he has a book titled uh, an edited book titled The Darker Angels of Our Nature, where he actually goes through the argument that violence has actually declined over time. He argues that's not the case. And also the other one is Bear Bromoller with Only the Dead. That's the book uh, uh, specifically about war, the argument that war has declined 
over time. So just to, for people to check those two interviews and books, by the way, which are very good. So when may, may I add something real fast, if, if you don't yeah. mind? Yeah, yeah, um, just, sure. just, you know, to, to me, like Picker's argument is, um, let me think of how to put this. So like, imagine, uh, you know, you, you, you go back in time and there's, there's like a billion people on earth mm -hmm. and 10% uh, uh, of them have died in wars over the past year. So, you know, a, a significant number, but total population is 1 billion. And imagine you like hop in a time machine, go back and visit the uh, somebody living in this era. And you say, uh, oh gosh, you know, your, your world looks horrible. Ours is so much better. And they say, well, um, you know, why is that? Like how many people have died in wars over the past year in, in the future? And the person responds, oh, 10 billion. And they go, 10 billion? That's, how is that better? That's, that's way worse than 10% of 1 billion. And the person says, no, 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 you don't understand. There are 100 trillion people in the future. And so 10 billion, that ends up being, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm revealing how bad I am at math off the top of my head, but a smaller <laughs> percentage than 10%. Oh no, so you don't understand. It's it's a smaller percentage. And the person goes, yeah, but it's 10 billion. And so it's to me, that's that's what the argument, you know, boils down to. And you know, I don't know, I guess in a sense, like, yeah, statistically, maybe it so assuming the statistics are right, maybe this guy has good arguments that Picker's wrong about statistics, but even assuming the statistics are right and uh statistically finals has declined. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I mean, but the 20th century was, I mean, they called it the, the hemoclasm, you know, just the, the bursting forth of blood from the world, two world mm -hmm. wars and so on and so on. I mean, just unimaginable wars. So it's like, no, 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 you can't just increase the human population to decrease the percentage of an enormous number in absolute terms of people dying mm -hmm. and say things are better like this. So anyways, just a little aside. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, do we do we have time for just one quick last question? Okay. Perfect, so, yeah. uh, I would like to end this because we've already had three interviews, two of them about your book, and I'm really curious about this. What do you think can be the consequences of being exposed to eschatological thinking or eschatological narratives? Because it seems to me that on the one hand, perhaps it can motivate people to pay attention to certain potential real existential threats, like, for example, climate change. And I'm not implying with that that climate change can lead actually to human extinction, but at least it's a big danger out there. But on the other uh, on the other hand, we've talked here a lot about long termism, eugenics, and some extreme political agendas based on a fear of humanity going extinct. I don't know exactly when in the future. So, what would be your take on that? I mean, do, do you think that it can be mostly good or mostly bad? for people to be exposed to eschatological narratives or does it depend on the narrative itself? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, I think if you are critical of some of these views, then um, understanding them is probably good, mm -hmm. especially because you know some of these kind of eschatological narratives, like the ones involving uh, existential risk associated with long-termism and transhumanism and the test real bundle of ideologies, um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it, 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 those ideologies are super influential. So it's good to, to understand them. Yeah. Um, let me think, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I, I think historically there's a good case to be made that many of the most significant events in Western history have involved eschatological promises and fears so yeah, you know what would be one example of that yeah sure so uh oh so i mentioned western history but it, okay let's just broaden it to, to global history okay um the the two most uh violent 
uh, deadly wars uh, or conflicts. Um, first is World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, Hitler used a lot of uh, the employed and exploited a lot of Christian eschatological themes. You know, so he even promised a thousand year, um, you know, a thousand year reign of the, the, the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that is, is uh, ties into directly this Christian prophetic notion of the millennium, uh, millennial kingdom. So it's like, okay, that at least in part, I mean, there, there was this notion of just, there's this glorious future that awaits us. Um, you know, we're in this sort of cosmic struggle between good and evil, the Nazis thinking they're good, you know, and, and yeah. other ethnic groups are the embodiment of evil and, and so on. And so there's, they're engaged in this cosmic struggle and at the end of the struggle awaits a utopian paradise. Um, and and uh, by the way, related to that, I might be wrong, but didn't they also imply that the Jews were actually an existential threat to the Aryan race and to the Germans? Yes. Um, this isn't sufficiently fresh in my memory um, to really say either way, but that sounds right, I think. You know, yeah, I, I'm also not yeah. one hundred percent sure. Uh, yeah, it it just seems to me it sounds right to me at least. I uh yeah um I, I'm fairly sure that that's the case. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean that's another connection. Um, the second most uh deadly conflict was the Taping Rebellion in mm -hmm. the uh in the 19th century. I think around the mid 19th century. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know just enormous numbers of people died. And that was between the uh, King dynasty, I think it was, and a, a, an apocalyptic movement called the Taping Heavenly, Heavenly Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they believed that also they were in this sort of apocalyptic cosmic struggle between good and evil. And so, I mean, th those are two examples. There, there are all sorts of, um, uh, you know, terrorist attacks. I mean, the 9-11 attacks perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, Al um, you know, Al-Qaeda was very much an apocalyptic uh, or apocalyptically minded um, uh, terrorist organization. The Islamic State is, I mean, and I mentioned 9-11 because, yeah, it was just like, it wasn't a war, but I mean, it changed the course of history, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I mean, it was a hugely uh, momentous uh, event. Um, yeah, you sort of say the same thing with ISIS, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they were, you know, very explicitly apocalyptic and and believed also you know that uh, islamic um you know certain passages in the prophetic hadith uh were actually it was their role to actively mm -hmm. fulfill those those prophecies so yeah, yeah i don't know I, I feel like you know there are some uh, i mean it goes way beyond that as well i mean there are scholars who refer to um a, a certain group of evangelicals in the u.s which is an enormous uh um demographic as the Armageddon lobby mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know their their support for evangelical uh, uh, politicians and right. evangelically consistent policies such as a an unwavering support for Israel all of that comes down is is intimately connected with their eschatological mm -hmm. view because you know the what lies beyond uh, Armageddon it's the millennial kingdom mm -hmm. well what is necessary for Armageddon to unfold well you need the the great tribulation uh to or the tribulation to, to happen the great tribulation is part of that the tribulation happens seven year period of of you know um during which the antichrist uh reigns well all of that is to say you can't have the tribulation without a jewish state in palestine and so consequently a lot of them are just you know um th th their support for israel is non-negotiable and it's it's ultimately deeply anti-semitic <laughs> you know, it's like right. on their view, the, the Jews are going to go to hell or they're going to be converted. And they're basically just using Israel mm -hmm. uh, for the purpose of ensuring that the eschatological narrative is actually fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So it's this This is another. Yeah, just to, to in a long winded way to answer your question about why I think, um, you know, a lot of like major historical events uh, all the way up to the present have had eschatology kind of at their core 
And, mm -hmm. and consequently, understanding eschatology, I think, is, is like really important for understanding what the hell is going on and, and what's, you know, why things have happened in the past the way they have. Okay, so I guess that's a great note to wrap the interview on. And the book is, again, Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Torres, as I said at the beginning, it's always an immense pleasure to talk to you. I loved all of our conversations and I couldn't recommend the book uh, enough. I really loved it. I loved it. It's one of my favorite 2023 books. So thank you so cool. much for writing it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, yeah, it's absolutely lovely chatting with you for a third time and, and hopefully there will be a fourth. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com and also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perergo Larson, Jerry Muller, Ernst, Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Forrest Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinasi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Kavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergor Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun, Machado, Jonathan Labyrinth, John Nyars, Tantanti, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weyre, Tom Hamel, Sardis, France, David Sloan, Wilson, Yasila, Desara, Ujo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavlos Tazewski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stephanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Ignick, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadrian, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.